on to chapter 17, the first chapter, oh, and about half a dozen, all of which will speak to different significance tests for different situations. Uh, chapter 17 introduces you to a new distribution, the T distribution, and presents uh, procedures that use the T distribution in regards to means. To this point, we've covered two inferential procedures for means, and those are confidence intervals and then also the large sample test of the mean. Both of these require that the sample size be greater than or equal to 100. Now, when n is less than 100, the estimate of the standard deviation of the sampling distribution can be inaccurate. The normal distribution is presuming that this estimate is accurate, and even more formally, it's presuming that we, we don't have an estimate, but that we actually know the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. So when we are using an estimate, um, and in particular when we're using an estimate where uh, there can be some error in that estimate, the appropriate distribution to use for inferential statistics is not the normal or Z distribution, but is instead the T distribution. Now, before we get into the T distribution per se, I need to introduce you to the concept of degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom are the number of independent values that remain after mathematical restrictions have been applied. So, suppose that there were 25 cases in a sample. Suppose that you know the value of 24 of those cases and that also you know the value of the mean. With some arithmetic, you could figure out the value of the 25th case. So in this situation, the 25th case does not have a value that is free to vary, but rather its value is known based on the value of the mean and the other 24 cases. So this is an example where we have 24 rather than 25 degrees of freedom. Let's just do a, a simpler example. Let's suppose that we have three cases and that we know that the value of the first case is 1 and the value of the second case is 2 and the value of the mean is also 2. What is the value of the third case? Well, we could just use some trial and error and it's, it's pretty easy to see that if we conjecture the value of 3 for the third case, then we can add together the three values, 1 and 2 and 3, and they sum to 6. There's three values. The mean is 2. So therefore, I mean, we've figured out that the value of the, the third case is 2. So in this situation, two values were given. Also, the mean was given. Um, we could figure out the value of the third case. The value of the third case wasn't free to vary. So we had, in this example, two degrees of freedom rather than three. Now, for procedures uh, that we're going to study in this chapter, all of which involve a single sample mean, degrees of freedom uh, will equal n minus 1. As uh, the, uh, for instance, um, in this situation, if there are 25 cases in our sample, it will be the case that their degrees of freedom will equal 24. 25 minus 1 equals 24. So, let's learn a little bit about the t-distribution. It isn't a single distribution, as is the normal distribution, but rather 
it is a family of distributions. That is, a group of distributions that are derived by a common procedure or formula. Uh, in fact, there is a different T distribution uh, for each uh, different degree of freedom. And each of these different T distributions has a different shape. For this chapter, uh, we're going to be dealing with uh, simply one sample, uh, and therefore our degrees of freedom are always going to be n minus 1. So let me uh, compare the t distribution and the normal distribution for you, and uh, the next slide will be a, a visual. When sample size is small, which is the same thing as to say when uh, degrees of freedom are low, the shape of the t distribution and that of the normal distribution differ substantially. As sample size increases, the shape of the t distribution increasingly comes to resemble that of the normal distribution. By the time sample size is 100 or greater, the shapes of the t distribution and the normal distribution are almost identical. Here are uh, three t distributions and you can see that the shape of each of these distributions differs. Uh, this solid black line here conveys the shape of a t distribution when sample size equals 5, which is to say when degrees of freedom is 4. Now then, the dotted line is for 19 degrees of freedom, and the gray line uh, conveys shape with 99 degrees of freedom. So observe that when n is small, as is demonstrated by a solid black line, the t distribution has very thick, elongated tails. Uh, indeed, these tails are much thicker and much more elongated than are those of the normal distribution. And in a pragmatic sense, this is the biggest uh, difference uh, in the shape of a t distribution for low degrees of free freedom and the normal. It's the thick, big tails of the t distribution. Now, uh, actually, you can see that uh, the shape of the t distribution for degrees of freedom equals 19, the, the dots, and for degrees of freedom equal 99. Uh, th these shapes are very nearly identical. And indeed, uh, particularly when we have degrees of freedom equal 99 and sample size of 100, we have a t distribution whose shape is almost indistinguishable from that of the normal distribution. So if, for instance, I was to plot a fourth distribution in this figure, that being a normal distribution, your mind's eye could not see any difference between its shape and that of the distribution with 99 degrees of freedom. So in a normal distribution, the percentage of cases that are located between two given z-scores is the same for all normal distributions. All normal distributions have the same shape. So for instance, in, in a normal distribution, 95% of cases are located between a z-score of minus 1.96 and a z-score of 1.96. And I'll just mention, it's, it's almost uh, you know, misleading you to say all normal distributions, because in a sense there is only one normal distribution, and it has uh, the particular shape that it does. On the other hand, uh, for the t distribution, the percentage of cases located between two t scores varies by uh, degrees of freedom. So, for instance, for degrees of freedom equals 4, 95% of cases are located between t-scores of minus 
2.78 and plus 2.78. For the degrees of freedom equals 99, these scores are minus 1.98 and 1.98. And just observe, you know, how similar these values are uh, to those for the uh, normal, which are minus 1.96 and plus 1.96. So this uh, figure shows our three different uh, t distributions and it shows uh, the t-score that encompasses 95% uh, of cases for each. So that you can see that in uh, the t-distribution where degrees of freedom is 4, the 2.5% tails are defined by minus 2.78 and plus 2.78. On the other hand, uh, we talked about the t-distribution where degrees of freedom equals 99, and here our 2.5% uh, tails are so very, very similar uh, to those of the normal distribution. They begin at uh, minus 1.98 and plus 1.98, which differs hardly at all from the values for the normal. And indeed, the shape of this t distribution is effectively that of a normal distribution. So, uh, the t distribution changes its shape for different degrees of freedom. You can think of it as a adjusting for the error involved in the estimate of the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. So this is the standard error of the mean, and there, there can be error there that's non-negligible. So when sample size is less than 100, and for that matter, when it's greater as well, the T distribution is adjusting its shape. Uh, and by adjusting its shape uh, to the uh, different degrees of freedom, and in essence accommodating the error in the standard error of the mean, it yields accurate results an inferential statistical procedure. So, when uh, n is less than 100, you need to use the t-distribution rather than the z-distribution in inferential statistics. So, I mean, we're going to start with uh, uh, confidence intervals. And uh, so, indeed, uh, when n is less than 100, you need to use the t-distribution to form confidence intervals. The formulas in Chapter 13 for confidence intervals are not sufficiently accurate. Now, when n is greater than 100, uh, confidence intervals uh, based on the t distribution are ever so slightly more accurate than are those based on the, the normal distribution. Uh, I would recommend always using uh, the t distribution for confidence intervals, uh, but when n is 100, the, the, the advantage in accuracy is uh, is very uh, very minimal. Now, uh, confidence intervals based on the t distribution uh, will yield accurate results in the in the conditions described here. Basically, there's an issue with skew. If you have a very uh, strongly skewed sample uh, distribution, you need to be careful that your sample size uh, is adequate. Uh, the, the combination of extremely small sample size and um, skew can it can result uh, in inaccurate results if that skew is strong enough. I recommend using the t-distribution when sample size is 20 or greater and uh, you don't see indication of extreme skew uh, in your sample. I mean, and you could um, refer back to chapter 5 figures to, to look at uh, different degrees of skew. And then also you use a uh, the t distribution, even when extreme skew is present, provided that sample size is 100 or greater. If you found a distribution with considerably more skew, even than the uh, extremely skewed figure in Chapter 5, it's, you might want to uh, be uh, careful in doing the t distribution there. But here's our working guidelines you do want sample size of at least about 20. You want to be sure you don't have extreme skew. And uh, if you get up to sample size of 100, you're going to get accurate results even with such skew. So here are two formulas for 
the confidence interval of the mean based on the um, t distribution. Uh, formulas include an estimate of the standard error of the mean, just as did uh, the confidence interval formulas in chapter 13. They differ from the formulas in chapter 13 because they include t, whereas in chapter uh, 13, when we were doing 95% intervals, uh, 1.96 was in the formula. And when we switched to 99% intervals, uh, the value was uh, 2.58. So we're going to have varying uh, values of t uh, depending on the degrees of freedom. And our degrees of freedom is going to equal n minus 1. So let's do a problem. We have sample size of 25. We have a mean of 4.35 and a standard deviation of 1.2. And this is in a sample of children in foster care placement. First step in our confidence interval formula is to estimate the standard error of the mean. Here's that formula. And the calculations are carried out. Uh, the standard error of the mean is estimated uh, to be 0.24. The uh, second step is to calculate degrees of freedom. So n is 25. Uh, subtracting 1, we have 24 degrees of freedom. The third step is to find the t-distribution table in the back of the text and insert the appropriate t into the formula. So for our problem, we have 24 degrees of freedom. So we come down the degrees of freedom column to find 24 degrees of freedom. And the heading above uh, this column is asking for number of standard deviations within which 95% of cases are located. And for 95% confidence intervals, and we're wanting a 95% confidence interval in our problem, um, we need to uh, reference this column. So there is the T, 2.064, that we're going to plug into our formula. We're finding a 95% confidence interval, and I guess I should have mentioned that before we went um, off to look at the table. But uh, if it was the case that uh, we had decided that uh, we wanted a 99% confidence interval, we would have used uh, uh, this far right column, and we would be plugging 2.797 into our formula. You know, you can see then that the 95% confidence interval always are plugging a, a larger value of t into the formula, so they're going to re always result in a, in a wider confidence interval as contrasted to the 95% interval. So that's just the very same situation as was the case in our chapter 13 formulas that use the normal distribution. So we plug the uh, 2.064 from the table into our formula. The first thing we do is to multiply 2.064 by the estimate uh, of the standard error of the mean, which was 0.24, and this yields 0.495. Our sample mean was 4.35 placements, so we're going to add and subtract 4.95 from that, and that yields a confidence interval spanning from 3.855 to 4.845. We can be 95% confident that the mean number of foster care placements in the population of children from which this sample was randomly selected is within the range that spans from 3.855 placements to 4.845 placements. Now, I went ahead and I calculated the confidence interval uh, using the uh, normal distribution uh, formula from chapter 13. So I plugged 1.96 rather than 2.064 into the formula. The confidence interval that uh, I calculated using the normal distribution formula came out to be 3.88 to 4.82. So that confidence interval is slightly narrower uh, than is the confidence interval that we calculated with the uh, t-distribution.
So when you use the normal distribution, you're always going to get a confidence interval that's very slightly narrower than that uh, uh, that you'd get with the T. And I, I guess I'll re rephrase and say if N was less than 100, the confidence interval could be considerably narrower if N is 100 or greater then the difference between these confidence intervals is going to be very small. I recommend, and it's common practice, to, to always use the, uh, the t-distribution formula. We mentioned uh, earlier that if you want a 99% confidence interval, then you would use the far right row in the uh, t-distribution table. So our next step is to uh, carry out the one sample t-test. And we do that in the next video.